isn't it a beautiful day out there? Uh, that wasn't nearly as good a response as I was expecting. <laughs> You know, when I was a, a kid, I, I have to share something with you that I know is going to surprise you. I was not the most popular child in my school. I know, I know, it, you, it, it's a shock, but I really wasn't. Uh, I spent a lot of time alone. I spent a lot of time enjoying my own company because being around others could sometimes be a little tough, you know? Kids are cruel. Girls would go after the more popular guys, etc. So oftentimes I would kind of just be by myself. And one of the places that I really liked to go was my garage. I enjoyed my garage. I built a, uh, a kind of a dojo in there, a training gym. I, uh, when I was a little kid, we used to have like a refrigerator box or maybe a hot water box and in the garage, I would crawl in there and you know make myself a little fort, and the dryer would be running or the washer, you know, just kind of just chilling all by myself. I would get out sometimes, and I would take a tennis ball and a racket. I would knock it back and forth against the wall or the the door inside the garage for a long time. I'd spend hours in there, and in my fantasy world, I would have this. This large family, I'm, I'm an only child, I would have this large family with lots of uncles and aunts and cousins, and we would have this entire community, almost like our own city, that I would be able to relate to all of these people, and if I didn't like what was going on in my fantasy, I could change it, right? Because it was all something I could control. It was comfortable. There were no uncomfortable surprises from people. Nobody who didn't like me. No hurt feelings. Do you have a garage? Do you have a place like that? I had to learn, though. I had to learn to get out of my garage. I had to learn to engage. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, people will let you down. But I had to learn to get out there. Because that's where life was. Right? I had to learn to go beyond myself. Sometimes we in the Christian community have spiritual garages. We have our own little garage where everybody kind of likes us. We get along with people. We know our place. It's comfortable, right? We're, we're even willing to let other people come into our garages, right? But they come in on our own terms. It's a little fortress, a little place of comfort and security. Thing is, though, we can't remain in our spiritual garages. We've got to get beyond ourselves. There's a big world out there. A world of a lot of people who have no idea who Jesus Christ is. We've got to get beyond ourselves. We've got to move out into the world. Our memory verse, Acts 1.8, says this. It says, but you will receive, this was at Pentecost, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is talking about what was going to come at Pentecost. This Holy Spirit coming. And then at that time, His disciples were going to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all the world. How do you think the disciples felt? They were used to a very small spiritual barrage in many ways. And all of a sudden, they were going to be thrown out into a much bigger world. Were they uncomfortable? Yeah. Was it tough? Was it going to challenge them? Yes. But they had to step out. 
They had to go beyond themselves. And in so doing, did they get hurt? Yeah. A lot of those early disciples were martyred. A lot of those early disciples suffered. And the people they led to Christ suffered. And yet they found a much better world. And they left for us a legacy of faith. Because quite frankly, we wouldn't be in this room if they hadn't gone beyond themselves. That legacy of faith, our faith blesses us, doesn't it? Our faith blesses us. We are so incredibly blessed. But the thing is, that faith that we have received is never meant to be kept to ourselves. Just like with the early disciples, it was always meant to be shared. It was always designed to not just rest here with us or in these walls, but to go beyond them. When I was in college 15 years ago, I changed my major several times, but one of the majors that I had ended up using in life that I was early on a major in was journalism. And in journalism, one of the things I remember in my brief time as a journalism major, one of the things I remember learning, which is kind of a reminder of what I'd heard earlier on, but I just remember it very specifically from journalism, were six questions that you had to ask whenever you wrote something. You had to ask the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, and the why. Because in an article, you had to have that there. Always those six questions. But you know, it doesn't, it's not just in journalism, is it? It's in probably a lot of the papers, people, a lot of you students have written in school. For those in business, we see it in business proposals. You see it in feasibility studies. You see it in lots of different kind of marketing things when you're looking at expanding multiple disciplines. Use those six questions. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. And the thing is, is those same questions apply to our outreach, to our getting beyond ourselves, to moving out into the world. The first two are the who and the what. Who and what? All of the six questions are important for understanding, but these two focus really on our topic, right? Of what we're going to need to be, be looking at. And the first one is who? Who should we reach? If we're going to do outreach, who should we reach? There's a lot of people out there, right? Any idea how many people are right now in the world? Quiz time. How many people are in the world today? How much? Six point one million. Whoa! Seven point five and counting. Seven point five billion people out there. That's a lot of people, right? What's the most populous country in the world? China at 1.4 billion. Second most populous. Yeah. At 1.1. 1.3. Over 1.3 is catching up with China. Third most populous. United States. At how many billion? We're not there yet. 326 million. Okay. Land-wise, we're about the size of China, but 1.4 billion, 326 million. And we got a little bit more space, right? What about Malaysia? Uh, 27. Huh? 27. 27. I think it's around 31 million right now. You got to, you know, the birth rate. You know?
What about languages? I get this question a lot. People ask me, well, how many languages are out there? 20, 30, 40? Huh? 2,000. 2,000. Going up. 5,000. Going up. No. Not almost. According to Ethnologue, which is probably the best source out there for languages as far as studying, etc., currently distinct languages, 7,099. 7,099. Two thirds of them are in Asia and Africa. In Africa, for example, there are 2,144 languages being spoken. Asia, 2,294 languages being spoken. Papua New Guinea, right? Home to, get this, 840 distinct languages. It's a small place, but they got a lot of talkers. <laughs> and they don't always communicate with each other. 840 distinct languages. Indonesia is number two with 709 distinct languages being spoken in Indonesia. What about religion? What's the, I mean, what's the biggest religion in the world? Hinduism. Actually, Christianity. Those who at least have some affiliation who claim it. Now, realize that when some people will claim they're Christian because they live in a place <laughs> as Christian. They're not necessarily Christian. But those who claim Christ or some affiliation with Christ, 31% of the population of the world. Okay? Um, that means that 69% of the world is not. And that, of course, figure would go up if you consider how many nominal Christians there are. 69. Let's just concentrate on the 69. 69% of the world. What is that in numbers? Go get out your calculators, I'll tell you. It, right now, is a little over... You can have your calculator out. What did I tell you? Okay. <laughs> a little over 5 billion people out there don't know Christ. Do we have a job to do? Yes. Wow. Talk about an outreach field. Five billion people who don't know Christ. So the who? There's a lot, but there's a simple answer. Second Peter 3.9. <coughs> The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Read this. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't say, I just want these people. I just want those people. God doesn't want anyone to perish. None of those 5 billion, none of the 7.5 billion, he doesn't want anyone to perish. And you and I, people, we're His hands and feet. We're His hands and feet. We're His voice to the world. So what are we sharing? Are we sharing just a religion? Are we going out and saying, this is Christianity. Let's see, in our Christianity, you come to church on Sundays, you sit here and you listen to Pastor John, and, and you sing a few songs and you do these things. Is that what we're sharing? That's, that's not really Christianity. That's maybe the way we practice it. What are we sharing? The what is we're sharing life. The life is found in Jesus Christ. Christ puts it this way by John 14, 6. Jesus answered, He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the life. Our job is to share life. To who? To everyone out there. The thing is, is, do we really believe that? I, if I, I put this on the on the slide here, or Grace put it on the slide. Thank you, Grace. Put this on the slide. We read that. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me ask you, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Uh, some of you may not. Yeah. Do you believe that? Yes. yes. Then if we believe that, if we believe that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ, if we believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, what are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? We have a responsibility to share the news. We have a responsibility to not just sit in our pews, but to share the news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. Jesus said that after loving God, what was the second greatest commandment? <coughs> Love your neighbor as yourselves. And it was, as we've seen in the past, who are our neighbors? What? A lot of people out there. <laughs> Basically everyone. I mean, technically, if you look at the neighborhood, right? Uh, neighborhood of Oklahoma is Texans, so we should you know, share it with the Texans. Or, you know, a couple of a couple of states, a couple of doors down, we have California. Or a couple of countries away, you know. I mean, you, you can expand it. The neighborhood's big. We should love, though, others as ourselves. So if we truly love, if we truly love, why wouldn't we want to share life? Why wouldn't we want to share the good news, the greatest news, Possible. Let me give you a weird scenario. Let's say that here in this tornado-prone, earthquake-prone occasionally place that we live in, suddenly, God forbid, a disaster happened, and all of a sudden we're all sitting here, crash, bam, the roof comes down, gets really confused, fire breaks out, smoke gets going. Man, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out? And you happen to be able to see through the smoke, etc., and find that exit. You can get out. And so you get there, you open the door, you found freedom. What do you do? Just run out? No. You're probably going to look back inside the building and go, oh, I want to take someone with me. I want to tell somebody about this. I want to show them that the exit's there. And so you run back in and you try to get somebody and you're probably going to go to somebody you're really close to, right? And maybe they'll come with you. Or maybe you'll come to somebody and you say, hey, let's go, let's get out there. And they're saying, well, I don't really think it's that bad. <laughs> no, I, you know, a little smoke, hey, the wind will blow it away. No problem. You know, I'm comfortable where I am. Or maybe somebody else, well, no. I don't believe there's only one exit. I believe there's several exits. Many different exits to love. You see the analogy? <laughs> Lots of people out there with those kinds of answers. That doesn't change the fact that buildings burn. That doesn't change the fact that there's one exit. And that we have the answer. So basically, when we have the answer, we know where the one exit is, and the building is burning around us, and we do nothing. Oh, we decide what well, I'm going to say, Howie. Howie's a nice guy. I'm going to say, Howie, but I'm going to leave June. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what are we saying? Are we picking who dies and who doesn't? Are we looking out around us and saying, you're worth saving? I'm not so sure about this one. We can't afford to be choosing. 
We can't afford to decide who lives and dies. Because Christ was, it wasn't. When he died, he died for all of us. But that does not negate the responsibility we have of sharing that life. Of making sure that everyone around us knows that he is the way and the truth and the life. So once we know the who, which is everyone, and the what, which is life, then we come to the when and the where. When and where. Since it's true confession's time, I confessed about my garage earlier. Let me also confess that occasionally I like to procrastinate. Anybody like to procrastinate in here? No? No? Howie's going, no, never. I never procrastinate. That's great, Howie. Your nose is growing, Pinocchio. Um, yeah, most of us do. Most of us like to put off. My wife, who is back after seven months, thank you. My wife can tell you that occasionally, I procrastinate. She'll tell you stories, for example, of how when I was first teaching, that I would sometimes not want to grade papers. In fact, I would sometimes let my papers stack up till all semester. And I would just put them in boxes. <laughs> and at the very end, it would get to the point where I had to do something because I had to get somebody a grade. My wife would be digging them out of the box to grade them for me because that's it. Some things can't be put off. We have no idea how long any of us have in this world. We never know how long that door will be open for other people. You know, I... I find I'm getting to the age now that occasionally I will hear about one of my classmates who's died. And they'll say, oh yeah, they just died, you know. And I'm like, wow. People die all the time. People pass on all the time. Did I do my job? Did I share with them when I could did I tell them about the open door? So when should we share life? Luke 10, 2. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It wasn't just for that time. If you look out right now, the harvest is plentiful. There's so many people out there. Who are needing to hear about God. But the workers are few. Those willing. It's not that we don't have a large population out there. 31%, right? Give or take. The workers are few. The sinners and sobers, there's a lot of those. But the workers, those willing to step out, those willing to share. As to where we share, we've already seen the answer to that in one of our in our memory verse, Acts 1 8. Let's look at it again. It says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What's our Jerusalem? Edmund? What's our Judea? Probably Oklahoma City, this area, our Samaria, maybe the parts of Oklahoma City area, area center we don't necessarily get along with, I don't know. But to the ends of the earth. Kind of huge, huge mission field out here. So let me ask you a question. Is everyone then in your Jerusalem? Or in your Judea, your Samaria? Is everyone in your school? 
The Christian. Everyone in your class? Christian. Everyone in your family? Everyone in your on your block, on your street, in your workplace. These are the places we need to start. Even if they can be the most difficult. Now, why are they so hard? Well, because quite frankly, people know us. Don't they? They've seen us at our best and at our worst. Which is why our daily witness is so important. Why our living for God moment by moment is so important. Because if we're going to be a good witness, if we're going to share with those around us, then we only have validity if they can really see life within us. <clears throat> because if they can't see a difference in our life, if they don't see Christ transforming our lives, what's the big thing? We're just sharing words, right? We cannot live as Christians part-time. Which brings us to the how. How. This is the trickiest of the questions to answer. There's countless ways of sharing Christ. But let's look at how Paul puts it when writing to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, he says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share its blessings. Basically, what Paul is talking about here is what theologians call incarnational ministry. Basically, where you are basically so filled with God that no matter where you are, in whatever situation, when you move into a town, etc., you can still be working like they are, living like they are, dressing like they are, etc., but you are so filled with Christ. His life shows through. Hudson Taylor had a very similar style. Hudson Taylor, when he went to China, when everybody else is standing along the coastline, it seems, and in their suits and, and preaching from their own way, etc., Hudson Taylor's dressing like the Chinese, cutting his hair like the Chinese, going into the interior without a whole bunch of money, going out there and sharing life. Incarnational Christianity. Of course, we must do incarnational Christianity well. There are some areas where it can be difficult. There is only one Christ, but sometimes when we so model Christ like that, people tend to follow us. And one of the problems that we end up having is what Paul encountered in the Corinthian church when they said, you know, some Paul... Some are following Paul. Some are following Apollos. Some are following Cephas. And Paul's saying, wait, you can't do that. You need to follow Christ. <coughs> See, our lives cannot completely replace our words. We need to not only live like Christ, incarnate Christ in that respect, but we also need to be looking for opportunities to share Making sure that we are pointing always to who Christ is. It's not in and of ourselves. But it's Christ living in us. Who they need to be seen. For example, we see that Paul 
was always looking for opportunities. Acts 17, 16 through 23. It says, well, Paul was waiting for them in Athens. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. What's Paul doing? He sees an opportunity. He sees a way to connect with them on their level. And he steps in. And we see later on that he goes on to share with them further about who this Jesus is, who this God is. Peter, we see, did the same thing. They're walking one day and uh, there is a lame man and they take an opportunity after, after the man is healed, after uh, they heal through the power of Jesus, they heal this lame man. They see an opportunity to share the gospel. See, that's what this is. This is this incarnational Christianity is about living like Christ in the community, but then taking those opportunities, looking for those opportunities to share further, to really share why you live this way. But the important thing, in the, one of the important things in incarnational ministry is to meet people where they are at, to find common ground. When I got here today, I parked, and there were three boys out there playing basketball. Three boys playing basketball, and I thought to myself, here we are. Here are these three kids they're just playing basketball in our block. They're not going to come into this church. Wow, I wish I could connect with them. Maybe if I play basketball. Anybody play basketball in here? You know, we have this wonderful new Agape Fellowship Center over there. We've got it to where hopefully we can open it up People can play basketball in there. But what we need is people who are going to be willing to come alongside to play basketball with these people and share life. You guys like to eat? Do you like food? You like to cook? Some of you like to cook. I'm not getting as many nods with the food. I have a cooking. I got with the food. <laughs> You know, there's people out there who like to cook. They like food. They like to bake, etc. Wouldn't it be cool if we had something where you could find common ground with people who like to cook and then share life? Sports, studying, culture. People have felt needs. People all around us. We can find common ground with them. You can learn about them, become friends with them, and then share Christ. Finally, we get to why. And we have several reasons why. But one of the best reasons is found in Acts 4, 11 through 12. 
It says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the strong cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Why are we sharing Jesus? Because He is the only answer. He is the only answer. There's no other way. But the big one is in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the Great Commission. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. That's some doubt. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is our marching orders. We are called. You and I, not just Pastor Lau and myself, not just Victoria, not just Dana Scott, all of us are called. All of us have a job. To share Christ, to share life with the world. We pray when we do the, the Lord's Prayer, our kingdom come. How's it going to come if we don't share? We are the gatekeepers. We are the ones who have the truth to share. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done. We're the hands and the feet. And the voice. Our job is to expand the kingdom. So, are we willing to step beyond ourselves? Are we willing to step beyond ourselves? Yes. It's, yeah. it's difficult. <laughs> Getting out of my garage was scary. But necessary. God is calling us to show His love to the world. But we can start with those outside our front door. Have you been long enough in your spiritual garage? The minute we're going to have a time of communion. And as you prepare your hearts for communion, just ask you to talk to God. Not only in confession, asking Him to put you on the right track, to draw you closer to who He is. Maybe also a time of commitment of asking God to show you how you can share with others. Because we have such a huge network. There's so many people we know. And how many of them are Christian? Are we willing to let them not find the door? Or are we willing to show them the 